Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports, episode 469. For some people, that's a very important number, so nice. I uh, hope you're doing very, very well. Uh, never fear, do not worry. The very next episode of the show, episode 470, will be all about the insane news going on in the NFL. Um, I actually recorded like half of that episode and then scrapped it because I was really tired and feeling out of it. And it was the middle of the day and news was dropping. And I'm like, I'm just going to wait and collect as much news and information as I possibly can. That should drop early Wednesday morning. Uh, But today's episode is with a really good friend of mine, Lawrence Owen. He is a person who covers the Indianapolis Colts. And so we dove into the Colts season. Carson Wentz, what's the plan for the Colts quarterback position? What moves should they make in the draft? Free agency. Uh, What was wrong with their season? Why did the Colts fail so badly? We talk about Tom Brady a little bit. Um, You can find him at Colts underscore law on Twitter. Go to Lawrence Owen, his YouTube channel. He's got a podcast, Believe in Colts, B. L-E-A-V in Colts. I love this guy. Lawrence Owen is one of my favorite people in the sports world. I don't have people on that I don't like. I have my friends on, people I talk to behind the scenes, people I deeply care about. And so without further ado, enjoy my conversation with Lawrence Owen. Joining me now is Lawrence Owen, Colts Law. Lawrence, how are you? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. You know, we were talking before the show started that Daylight Savings really threw me off. It's 6 a.m. here. I thought we were going to be recording at 7 a.m. And the Daylight Savings was like, no, sir. How about an hour earlier? Uh, I'm excited, though, man. we got a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, We're going to talk about Colts, obviously, a ton. But I actually want to start with something that broke yesterday was that Tom Brady's coming back. And I I mean, I, I, I don't... When he, quote, retired, he never said the word retirement. I think everyone kind of looked at him with a side eye and was like, are you really done? Are you sure? (laughs) What was your reaction when you found out that Tom Brady was coming back to the NFL? I was like, wow. Um, That took, what, all of five weeks? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That was... That was an impressive up and down ride, especially for Bucks fans, right? I mean, yeah. wow. They're like, we have no quarterback. Oh, we have Tom Brady again. Oh, good. Uh, but for a lot of people, I think that it upset a lot of people out there, though. If, mm-hmm. if you're not, you know, following Tom Brady, if you're a fan of another team, obviously, it because you're like, why did you – you know, put the stuff out there to make it look like you were retiring, you know, and then next thing you know, you're going to come back like a month later. It it made no sense. Now, you know, obviously there's a lot of memes out there about, you know, why Tom, oh, he gave it up for Lent. You know, he gave football up for Lent or uh, gas prices are so high that he has to come back, (laughs) you know, things like that. So, um uh, there's a lot of jokes going around about about Tom Brady coming back, but let's be fair. It's good for football. It's good for the NFL. I mean, Tom Brady brings in a lot of views, so um, uh, wish him nothing but the best. I, I I hope he does well, just not too well. <laughs> the uh, the roughest memes are when people are like Tom Brady when Giselle says she wants to hang out for the fourth time in one week, and he's like, <laughs> "Back to football!" I'm like, oh, that's brutal. Yeah, I, uh, right. You know, I, I will say. I if you reread what he said a while back, because it's funny, he actually he put out that Twitter post and Instagram post like I'm coming back. He's like in the last two months. I'm like, bro, you've been out of football for like a month. It hasn't even been two months that you've left. But what's interesting about it is when he when he did post, you know, whenever he quote, you know, hat, fake retired or whatever it was, that post saying thank you to Tampa, I'm leaving. He was very clear to say I'm not ready to make that competitive commitment right now. And I think him putting that out was only fair to Tampa actually because. If he wasn't coming back, they needed to make moves to survive without him. So if he mm-hmm. hadn't ever come back, because he wasn't sure, and if you're not sure, you got to be transparent about it. So I actually really kind of, with with perspective, look back and go, Tom did the right thing by communicating with this team, hey, I'm not sure if I'm coming back. So they could make moves if he didn't. And now he did, they're, they're really happy, obviously. But, um, you know, it's interesting to see a guy retire when he still clearly can play. It makes sense when you retire and your body can't do it anymore, 
but I can't imagine sitting at home watching people play football when I was physically not only able to play, but Tom Brady played at such a high level last year, like maybe his best year of his career. Can you imagine mm-hmm. sitting at home like he's going to go stir crazy? And I don't think retirement – I've got friends whose grandparents are retired, and some of them are really bored, and the ones that aren't bored are the people who started their own business or are doing something else other than what their career was because the people that say, I'm going to golf – get real bored after like two weeks. They're like, you know what? This retirement thing kind of sucks. I can only golf so much before my brain wants to explode. So um, I'm curious, actually, if it will not end up being a couple more years before Tom Brady really actually does retire, because is it really that great to be out of the sport you love? I mean, I think he's borderline addicted to what he does. It's real hard to curb an addiction. You know, so I, I don't know. What are your thoughts on all that? I think there's, there's two types of NFL players, right? There's the the player that loves football. They play because of the love of the game. And mm-hmm. then, of course, there's the player that's in there. It's a job. It's their paycheck. Yeah. It's what they do. And those types of players, after they get some money, will retire way earlier than what you expect them to, you know? Mm. Um or, you know, uh, because, you know, they don't want, they don't want, they know what the, the sport does on their body, right? AKA Andrew Luck, right? AKA, yeah. you know, a bunch of other guys that have left earlier than what we thought. Now, obviously, they may still love the game, but, you know, it, it's also a just their paycheck. And, you know, that that is what it is. Now you got guys like, uh, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, guys like that that are going to play. You you almost expect them to play until they cannot play anymore. You know, Peyton Manning obviously was lucky enough to go out on top, right, uh, winning a Super Bowl. But you could obviously tell that year he his body was so degraded that he wasn't able to be as effective as he used to be. Uh, same with Drew Brees. You know, just he was it wasn't there anymore for him. You bring up a good point. Tom Brady was still playing excellent football, right, uh, at the quarterback position for the Buccaneers, and then he just throws out that he wants to retire, and that puzzled a lot of people. Um, I think it was the whole situation of, you know, obviously he loves football, but at the same time, maybe, maybe he did take a few shots there, you know, at that last season for the Buccaneers, and it made him think, I'm healthy now, another year or two could put me in a bad spot. You know, I'm one injury away from having a, the rest of my life living less, right? You know, mm-hmm. like a, a bad knee shot or a bad head shot or something. So uh, it's a good possibility that happened. Plus, you know, he's got his family. So there was a lot to think about, a lot to, to go through. You brought up that great point about, you know, that, his announcement wasn't necessarily saying I am definitely retiring. It's more of, I can't make that commitment right now. And I didn't think about it like that until you brought it up and it makes perfect sense. So, um, yeah, that was definitely a good thing for him to do just so that he wouldn't put Tampa Bay in a bad situation where, you know, uh, they were all the way up to this point, say, and expecting him to come back or waiting for a response for him to come back and wasn't even looking, you know, for anybody. Mm-hmm. And then he would retire. That would that would be a, a, an awful situation. So he's always been – no one can say that Tom Brady has never been a team player, right? He's always been that guy who looks out for the team mostly. Uh, you know, all those years it, uh, with the Patriots, he, he, he was never one of the top five paid quarterbacks in the NFL. He was always looking to – um, help the team out, get weapons, stuff like that for championship runs. Uh, the only time he's ever really made really good money is at Tampa Bay. So, and even then he's out there, you know, recruiting guys, right? Yeah. Constantly. Come on in. Let's win a championship together. <laughs> I, uh, you know, if he was going to play again, I, I really did believe he was done with Tampa and going to maybe San Francisco. I, I was like, because why else say that if you're not done with Tampa? Because he didn't say goodbye to his career. He said goodbye to Tampa. Remember, like, he didn't mention the Patriots, never said the word retirement. His whole post was about Tampa Bay. And I'm like, oh, he's done with Tampa. But maybe he'll go, like, 
live his childhood dream of playing for the 49ers or something. It was interesting he came back to Tampa, but it makes sense because, I mean, look at their division. The Carolina's awful. <laughs> They've got, oh my gosh, the Falcons are terrible. The Saints have no coach, no quarterback. Like, it's, it's honestly what it was when he was with New England, where they've got this division that's full of awful football teams and then his really stacked football teams. So he's going to win his division easily. It'll be a cakewalk. And they have a lot of talent coming back. So I, I want to say, I, I was wrong about that one. I thought he'd go to the 49ers. And I would not be shocked if his career at some point took him there. Although with Trey Lance probably being their guy, it will be pretty hard for that to happen now. I think if there ever was a window for him to go to San Francisco and be that quarterback there, now was the only time that was ever really going to work out. So it looks like he's going to probably finish his career in Tampa. Um, I don't know, man. I, I really don't understand people who hate Tom Brady. I and Maybe a better way to put it, if you're a Bills fan or I mean, you're a Colts fan, right? You've seen Tom Brady go head-to-head with Peyton Manning for years and have some painful losses. And when you have a real rivalry against a guy, I understand not loving him. What I really don't understand about Tom Brady is when people don't respect him. It's one thing to like, I hate playing this guy. He always beats my team. Totally. But when you don't respect Tom Brady and what he's done, I think you just either don't know his story very well or we've got different values because his work ethic, the stuff he puts into the game, his leadership, his family, like somehow he's the greatest quarterback of all time and appears to be a really great dad too, which I can't imagine trying to make that all happen. So, um, And also, man, you and I both, I'm sure, experience this. When the football season comes to an end right after the Super Bowl, I'm burned out, man. I'm like, I need a week without football. I need to, like, play video games, get away, go to the beach, like, just be alone and away from the game. So I'm sure Tom's season came to an end and was like, I'm tired. Like, I miss my family. I'm tired. I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. And then he had a month to think about it. It was like, it's going to be pretty hard to watch Tampa Bay play without me this year. And... <laughs> In a, in a weird way for Tampa, I'm sure they're really glad because they were looking at their options. They're like, do we bring back Jameis Winston? Do we trade for Jimmy Garoppolo? Oh, thank God Tom Brady's coming back. It's almost like they have a new appreciation for Tom Brady. And can you imagine if Tom was like, I want to come back, and they're like, we're good, bro. Can you? Is there a world where that ever happens? Can you imagine that? That's an interesting question. Um the only time anything like that has ever happened, I think, was, you know, when the Colts moved on from Peyton Manning, right? He had that mm. surgery, yeah. and Peyton still wanted to play, right? And he still loved the Indianapolis Colts, but they had the first pick, and Andrew Luck was there, you know? That wasn't a a shot, you know, for either, either team or player, because, you know, that was Jim Mersey and Peyton Manning sitting there discussing the situation, and Peyton saying... You'd be stupid not to draft Andrew Luck. <laughs> well, I'll just move on if you don't mind. And and yeah. Ursay's like, all right, and that that happens. But in general, no. Uh, th- this is not a situation where that would be even plausible, right? I mean, even if they went out and got somebody already, right? I mean, e- even if they had already went out and 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 got, uh. <sighs> I don't Jameis Winston or already traded for Garoppolo or something like that. If Tom's like, Hey, I'd like to come back. They're not going to be like, no, no, dude, we already got our guy. No, that, that ain't happening at all. <laughs> Can you imagine Jimmy Garoppolo comes back and Brady's like, remember when you're my backup? Back to the bench, baby. <laughs> I got to say you, you brought up an, this is off topic, but an interesting hypothetical that if, the Colts had Peyton Manning hurt his neck and take a year off, and they have the number one overall pick. What if you'd had a draft class like this year rather than Andrew Luck? Like if you'd had Matt Corral and you know Malik Willis and Kenny Pickett available instead of Andrew Luck? I mean, would they have stuck with Peyton Manning? Because they might have actually. They might have think- said it. We got three more years of Peyton Manning or Kenny Pickett. We're gonna go with Peyton Manning. I mean, you almost would have to, right? I mean, even with the neck surgery. You don't look at that and go, you know, the, the only reason they went with Andrew Luck was because Andrew Luck was the highest prospect since Peyton Manning, right? Yeah. So yeah. you, you kind of go that direction, uh, being that, you know, Peyton was nearing the end of his career at the time. But at that point, no, no. I, I, I think I think Ursay and Manning would have definitely been on the same page and say, let's run this over again, you know? Yeah. Any other final thoughts on Tom Brady? Like, do you know... 
I mean, not that either of us know, but do you have any kind of predictions or anything on like maybe when he will be done? Because I really have no idea. I, I feel like it's becoming like with LeBron James for years. People said he's getting older. He's going to fall off a cliff. And every time I watch LeBron James, he's still really good at basketball. And I've kind of gotten to the point where with LeBron, I'm, I'm, it makes no sense to count him out. And it's the same with Tom Brady. Like, you can doubt Tom Brady all you want, but until he shows me he's declining, until he shows me he's not mm-hmm. interested in football anymore, I'm going to assume he's going to keep playing and playing at a high level. And I don't see an end in sight. Like, it's pretty funny to go back to that clip like for ye- from years ago now on first take where Max Kellerman's like, oh, he's going to fall off a cliff. And Tom Brady just literally won another Super Bowl and kept going and going and going. I don't see an end in sight, do you? Uh, I don't see an end in sight until he himself believes that he doesn't have a shot at another Super Bowl. And that's not yeah. even necess- like what you're saying. That's not, not necessarily even saying with Tampa. You know, if he belie- you know, if he runs it back with Tampa this year and they don't make the playoffs, but he feels like it wasn't his fault and mm. he thinks that maybe another team out there is just a quarterback away, then maybe he would move on and go to that team and continue playing. I um that's that's how I see it. Tom like you said, uh, Tom Tom loves football. And as long as his body can still handle it, he's still producing at a good level, I think that he'll probably continue to keep playing. Was there any hope in Indy that he would come be the Colts quarterback? Very, very, very few Colts fans was hoping for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that sh- I'm, I'm going to get eaten alive by a lot of Colts fans for this. <laughs> but I have to be objective, right? Yep. Look, Tom Brady... Had Tom Brady been there, and had we got him instead of Phillip Rivers, we would now have him three years in a row. We w- uh, The Indianapolis Colts wouldn't have been through this whole, you know, different quarterback every year for five, six, seven straight years, you know, now, uh, starting at week one. Uh, we wouldn't have went through the Carson Wentz situation. We wouldn't have went through a bunch of stuff. And there's a good chance, because Tom knows how to work an offense. And recruit the Col- people. Yeah, and recruit people uh, that the Colts could have went somewhere. But and, there's a lot there going on, right? I mean, because of the rivalry for so long. That would be probably the one of the biggest storylines in football. Huge storyline. Tom Brady goes to Indy. That would be monstrous. He goes to his rival for all those years. What? After Peyton Manning, his rival left. That would be a monster storyline. And um, Colts fans, a lot of Colts fans, just they have that inner. You talk about it, you know. It, it's a strong word, but they really don't like Tom Brady at all. You know, I don't want to use the H that 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 the yeah. hate word. You know, but at some point, some of these Colts fans have that word in mind when they think of Tom Brady. So. Uh, it probably it, it, it could have lost a lot of Colts fans had that had happened, and I think that's one of the reasons why <laughs> Ursay kind of leaned away from that one. You know, <laughs> I can't. You know, I am I am sad we never got to see that storyline. Tom Brady wearing his rival's uniform right? would have been incredible. And yes, it would have. Right? It it absolutely. It would it, have been like. Troy Aikman wearing a Niners uniform. Yeah, that's, <laughs> what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, man. Uh, or Aaron Rodgers going to, like, the Chicago Bears or something where you're like, what? Soldier <laughs> Field? Aaron Rodgers playing for the home team? What's going on here? Um, let's talk about the Colts, man, because I when I saw a lot of Colts fans celebrating when Carson Wentz got traded away. And – I hear the reports or at the athletic Carson Wentz rumored to be a bad leader. Doesn't want to be a very, doesn't want tough coaching. And I thought there were moments where Carson was the best player on the Colts last year, early on. And then there were moments at the end of the year where Carson Wentz was costing his team football games. So I, it's a very mixed bag. I thought it was pretty weird to celebrate when you trade away your starting quarterback and have literally nothing next. There's no first round pick. There's no apparent plan. I was like, Colts fans, are you really that happy you have nothing at quarterback now? Carson Wentz wasn't perfect, but he's better than nothing. So what are the Colts doing? And are you with me? Like the kind of thought like, hey, go ahead and celebrate, but at least Washington has a quarterback. You don't have anything now. Oh, it's, you're dead on. Um, <laughs> dead on. Oh, my goodness. So 
that's that's the thing. Okay, um, it was incredibly surprising to me. Now I I saw all the reports and the rumors and stuff, just like everybody else, and I was just kind of taking it with a grain of salt, you know, because. How do you tr- trade away, or straight, as reports said, if you can't find a trade partner, they were just going to release him, you know, and eat the dead cap and have no quarterback. And I'm like, how would you do something like that? That makes no sense. And then next thing you know, he's traded. But at least the trade, they got something out of it, right? They got a, a third-round pick. They got another third-round pick that could turn into a second-round pick if he plays 70% of the snaps. Plus Washington, and this is the big part, ate all of his salary, right? All $28 million mm. this year. So that freed up a lot of salary cap. And if you look at it as a third-round pick and a possible second-round pick, as opposed to what the Colts spent on him, they basically traded a first-round pick for a second-round pick for a one-year rental, right? Mm. That's, that's how I saw that uh, at the end of it. But... How do you trade away a guy? How does Chris Ballard trade away a starting quarterback? Because no matter how how you feel about him, he is still a starting quarterback in the NFL, right? Um, He's at least the top 20 guy on the planet playing the position. Yes, yes. Does he have a WTF moment every game? Absolutely. You know, (laughs) Uh, but at the same time, uh, what makes those also make some of those great, amazing plays that he performs, you know, on a on, on a gamely day basis as well. So, you know, uh, the Colts are definitely not in a better spot currently than what they were uh, two weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, they aren't because they have no quarterback right now. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if Chris Ballard had something or still has something like in the bag ready to happen and just needed Carson Wentz out of the building first for before he could make that happen, uh, whether it's a trade or a signing or something of that nature, maybe he needed that, uh, those picks for ammunition. Maybe he needed the salary cap. Maybe he needed to prove that, Hey, we're ready to move on. And the guy that I'm wanting to, to go get, uh, will be definitely be the starter here. He's not competing with Carson Wentz, that type of situation. Um, because there, Ballard's pretty good at keeping a lid on things, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That DeForest Buckner trade a couple years back, no one had any clue, nothing yeah. about about that. It's not like you know where you hear. Uh, Ooh, I have sources that say that this is going to happen and this is going to happen and leaks ha- leaks don't happen out of the Indianapolis Colts facility. So there is a good chance that Ballard does have something in the bag working on and we just haven't heard anything of it yet because free agency and stuff hasn't officially kicked off yet. Here's my theory on this because um, I really respect Chris Ballard. I think he's one of the best general managers in the entire NFL. He regularly does stuff that I really admire, respect, and go, it's pretty clever, pretty smart. I'm very surprised by that. The Carson Wentz trade felt impulsive. It didn't feel clever. It didn't feel well thought out. In fact, when the year ended and Jim Ursay, the owner, came out and said, we're done with Carson, it really hurt the trade value of Carson Wentz. People knew they were trying to get rid of him, and so they're like, we're not giving you a lot for him. We know you don't want him. Mm -hmm. I really think that unfortunately Jim Ursay had a heavy hand and heavy influence in the Carson Wentz trade. I don't know that Frank Reich was ready to just give up on the guy, the head coach. Frank Reich had this great relationship with Carson. We don't know what happened behind the scenes. We have no idea. But I would imagine that Frank Reich was like, let's run it back. Let's try it again. It didn't work, but year one, like we build off what we did last year. Jim Ursay, the owner, gave up on Carson and said, I'm sorry, but I'm not doing this anymore. I, I'm not. I'm refusing to continue with this guy. Chris, you better make a trade. Chris Ballard, you better figure it out. And it puts Frank Reich in this awkward situation where he's like, he even had to like apologize for this guy he brought in who, Frank Reich pounded the table for this guy and said, this is my guy. I believe in him. I want to work with him. Well, let's make that trade happen. And then to give up after one year is like, that's a, that's a really ugly look. And I think the only way that really happened was you had the owner, Jim Irsay, saying, 
I don't really care what anyone says. We're making this trade happen. We're giving up on Carson Wentz because it doesn't add up any other way. That Chris Ballard would really say, we gave up a lot for this guy. Now we're just going to give up after one year. That Frank Reich, the head coach, would apologize for a guy he clearly really, really likes. Was it perfect? No, but we can work with that. We'll build off what we did last year. How do you, what do you think of that? The idea that this was Jim Mercer's idea and not necessarily the best idea. Yeah, uh, very rarely does Jim Ursay, uh like force a hand, right? He's yeah. an owner that hires guys that, you know, he wants them to run their job, right? And he yeah. very rarely uh, steps in and says, this must happen, right? Uh, a couple times that that's happened, uh, last year with T.Y. Hilton, I think he got a hold. I think it was reported that he got a hold of Ballard and said, hey, we need T.Y. back uh, just for leadership. Yeah. Uh, and then last year in the draft when I don't think he, he forced the issue, but when the second round come up and um, it was getting closer and closer, he got a hold of Ballard and said, you really like this Jonathan Taylor guy, right? Go get him. And gave him the okay, basically, to move up, yeah. trade up, go get Jonathan Taylor, which, you know, obviously worked out. Um, but this is a situation where I think the I, I think Ballard stated it best in his postseason conference. The poison was there in his veins, right? Mm. How the season ended. You know, they went from week 16 being the team that nobody wanted to face in the playoffs to not even making the playoffs because of two losses and two losses that arguably should have been won. And the last loss was to the worst team in the NFL and they were beaten badly. Right. It, this what even though it wasn't all on Carson Wentz, that was a team loss on both weeks, but still someone has to be the fall guy in that situation. And I think Ursay had too much, uh, you know, poison in his veins over the loss and how the season ended. And I think, I think you're right. I think he, you know, pounded a table and says, we're moving on. I, I don't understand if it, if it was me personally, I'd be like, who do you want me to get? Right. You see what the market's like, who am I supposed to get in replace of him? Don't we want to, you know, at least be competitive this upcoming season, right? <laughs> but uh, when your boss tells you you have to do something, you kind of have to do it, right? Uh, unless you don't want him to be your boss anymore because you'll be fired. So, yeah, I I feel bad for Wentz in that situation. Uh, I don't think he had a, a, a full... Uh, chance, you know, generally that first year, you know, you don't have all that. Plus, he had no offseason, right? He had yeah, no offseason. Yeah, not off everybody's season. Tom Brady can go to a new team and win a Super Bowl in one year. I mean, that just doesn't happen ever. Tom Brady's an anomaly, not the rule. Exactly, exactly. And the, there was a lot of pieces that, uh, a lot of injuries, and then the COVID, and there's all kind of excuses. Did Wentz help his situation in some of the plays that he had on the field no but I mean they still had a better than 500 season you know they still won nine games last year and was very very close to making the playoffs I don't like the situation the Colts are in right now I understand why it happened I, I understand why he ended up getting traded but at the same time I don't like it you know yeah Let's go back to that moment because week 18, you're on the road at the Jacksonville Jaguars. Their fans hate their franchise so much they're wearing clown costumes. All you got to do is beat the worst team in football and you're in the playoffs. You know, the, the Steelers made it in with a tie. You win that game. You, you leapfrog them. You're the number seven seed in the AFC. You're a playoff team. Carson Wentz. Has two turnovers. They both lead to points for the Jacksonville Jaguars. You lose 26 to 11. Trevor Lawrence has one of his better games of his career so far in the NFL. You lose to the team with the number one pick in the NFL draft, the worst team in football, the Jacksonville Jaguars, who don't even have a head coach. I want to hear your emotions after that loss because I, I thought before the year started, the Colts were a playoff team. They're traded for Carson. It's going to be great. 
And you could not ask for a better scenario to be on the road against a terrible football team. All you got to do is win one game and you make it in. So how did you feel when that loss happened? Well, I was kind of, I steadied myself for it because the Colts have not done well in Jacksonville in years. Mm. Uh, Philip Rivers lost to him in Jacksonville uh, the year prior, right? Yeah. Um, it seems Week like... one, Minshew beat you guys. I remember that too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Oh, baby. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is, it, it's just one of those, it, it's, it's kind of like Miami versus New England, right? Every time New England goes to Miami, they end up, you know, uh, Miami somehow finds a way to win. Uh, mm. It's just, it's just one of those things where, Interdivisional games, you can't just write them off, right? Sure, uh, like the Colts, both times they played Houston, uh, I think the total score ended up being like 62-3 to uh, between both games uh, where the Colts just blew them out both times. But that, can't ha- that doesn't happen all the time. You know, interdivisional games, things happen. You know, teams know each other. It, it, and so I kind of steeled myself for a possibility of a loss. It, it didn't. It didn't make it hurt any less. Uh, game was over. I'm like, we're not in the playoffs. We this this sucks, you know. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I want to bring up something because about two weeks later, I was thinking, who do I blame? Right? Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to be blamed for what happened against the Raiders and what happened against Jacksonville. And then I it, it took me back to the Cardinals game. The Colts played that game with like half their starters because like all the rest of all half their starters was on COVID. Now, then they come back and they play against the Raiders and they look not quite up to par. And then Jacksonville, not up quite up to par, but their starters are playing because of the new rule that the NFL passed, right? Um, can I... From what I understand, I, I'm sorry about bringing up COVID if this is a, a thing. It's it's relevant, so I'm I'm happy to relevant to the story totally. I had I had COVID, right? Yeah. I had COVID um, uh, in October, November, somewhere around in there. It took me about six weeks to start feeling somewhat okay after I had it. Hmm. These guys were out there. These starters who had COVID were playing the very next week. And the week after, I there's no way on God's green earth I could have played those games, two one two weeks after having COVID. You know, there's just no way. So I'm thinking, did that have that big of an effect? You know, all these players that missed because you know they had uh, the illness, that probably played a massive play because even Darius Leonard's like, you know, our practices were awful. You know, like mm. going into the Raiders game, you know, um, it was slow, lackadaisical, that kind of stuff. It, I'm wondering if, if, if that had something to do with it, because so many guys that were starters were coming back from from that situation. Is that so? I was going to ask you, you know, what happened to the Colts last year? What's the thing, the culprit here? Was it Carson not playing very well? Is it coaching? Is it this? Is it that? Is it? offensive line like what's the problem sounds like is that what you're blaming is that like the thing that if you had to point to one thing I mean there's a lot of stuff little things you can point to but is that probably the main thing you're pointing to because I know that Colts fans are if you read Twitter anytime you see anything about Carson Wentz under the comments Twitter's not a real place as as Dave Chappelle once said but it's still it holds if that's the opinion of a lot of Colts fans you're seeing that play out on Twitter and they're posting Carson, you should have got blah, 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 blah. You should have done this. COVID, blah, blah, blah. Like, COVID is the thing that people are blaming the Colts fan base. Whether you like that or not, it is what the fans are doing. So you you, yeah, you got to report on it, right? Is that is that what you're seeing? A little bit. Uh, some blame can go on Carson Wentz. Some blame can go on Eric Fisher uh, yep. and the offensive line itself because they did not play up to par the way they have, you know, years previous. Uh, at least in pass protection, right? Yeah. Um, in, in, in the run game, they were phenomenal. But in pass protection, they were not very good. Mm. Um, the defense, 
certain times of the year. Uh, the middle part of the year, I thought the Colts' defense was phenomenal. They were mm-hmm. doing everything right. And then, like, the beginning of the year and then the end of the year, they were not playing well. Kenny Moore was getting burnt a lot. Darius mm-hmm. Leonard was, you know, not making the tackles that he normally makes, things of that nature. The guys didn't look like themselves. Exactly, you know. And I don't know if – if now, I can't – I don't know what to blame at the beginning of the year uh, because they had full training camps and stuff like that. Well, except for Carson Wentz and uh, uh, Quentin Nelson because they had their foot injuries. Yeah. Uh, injuries is another big deal. You know, they had a, a lot of key injuries across the team. Uh, Darius Leonard played on that bad ankle all his whole uh, season. Um, but teams deal with injuries. Teams... Every team had to deal with COVID. Every team had to deal with injuries. Every team had to deal with with things. And the Colts, just at times, were not able to do so. And mm. so, really, what I have to blame is just the team did not step up when it needed to step up. And yeah. that's that's all it is. That's, that's, that's all you can do. Could you argue that the Colts underachieved, but not as much as we think, where I don't think the Colts were a Super Bowl team. I thought they were a playoff team that underachieved by – like their season ended maybe three weeks o- earlier than it should have, right? Because – and you can – three weeks is not that long. In three games, th- that's two more wins they probably should have had on the, the whole year, right? And I-, I think you could argue, well, they started the year with Carson injured, guys got hurt. Like a lot of stuff objectively went wrong for the Colts last year. To start the year with your quarterback getting foot surgery is never a good thing. And if you look at it that way, that, hey, did they did they not win a Super Bowl? Yeah. Were they ever going to? I don't think so. So for them to be a game short of the playoffs and probably would have lost in the division around anyway, I don't know that it's that horrible of a failure when you look at it that way. You look at it as, man, we were close. A couple things went wrong. We were still really probably a player or two away from a Super Bowl anyway. Now we're three players away, needing a quarterback as well. It's, it's not a catastrophic failure when you look at it that way. What do you think of that, that theory and that thought? Well, going into the season, before the season started, I had the Colts winning 10, maybe 11 games and squeaking mm-hmm. into the playoffs as a wild card mm-hmm. team. I still had the Titans winning the division, right? So if, if I, I had them winning 10, going – 10 and 7 and squeaking into the playoffs they finished 9 and 7 that's only one game off so like you're saying they underachieved but in my opinion they didn't underachieve as badly as what a lot of people are saying right i yeah. I, I feel like i feel like could they have won more absolutely there were so many games that the indianapolis colts should have won i mean, they walked into how many games at halftime having double digit leads against teams Tampa Bay, the Ravens, uh, the Rams, uh, all, all sorts of teams that they they walked in. Uh, the Titans, lots of teams they walked in with double digit leads and ended up losing later on in the game off of one or two plays. You know, yeah. uh, they lost a lot of games by one score. So, you know, one or two plays here and there they. They get that 10, 11 wins and get into the playoffs, uh, no matter how the last two games finished out. So, uh, I don't, you're right. Uh, they did underachieve, but not to the point that, you know, this is a disaster. They need to be rebuilt, you know, that type of situation. I think the most level headed thing you could have done after the year ended was go, huh, we're like five to six small moments away from being a much better football team with a better record, better result, mm-hmm. I guess. And you look at the Raiders a couple of years ago. The Raiders had a season where they won like every game that was a one score game. Like those, those, because season comes, uh, your year comes down to like five to six, maybe seven small moments that are your defining moments as a team. If they all go your way, things are great. If they all go against you, things are not. And I feel like a lot of those small defining moments went against the Colts. But if I, if I'm the Colts this off season, I go, man, okay, we need a, I, I'd love to get another good receiver. I maybe get a couple, a little bit of um, depth on our offensive line, but we just got to tweak a couple things rather than blow up the quarterback. And I, look, I hear it's toxic. I hear all that stuff, but 
man, it just feels like a really strong overreaction from the Colts to walk away from Carson completely. And I I think he might do well in Washington. I don't again, no one's saying he's a top five quarterback, but he's definitely better than a lot of people on planet Earth at playing that position. And was he expensive? Probably more than he should have been. But you look at what the Vikings are paying Kirk Cousins, and you go, well, quarterback is <laughs> expensive. Like, I, I, I guess if Kirk's making 35 mil, is it that bad to have Carson make 20, 28? I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm really – I want to hear your thoughts on this, man. What should they do at quarterback? Because you're hearing Jimmy Garoppolo. You're hearing – all kinds of stuff. Maybe Andrew Luck's coming out of, out of retirement. Maybe that's the secret plan that we don't know is gonna gonna happen. Like, what are the Colts gonna do, and what do you want them to do at the quarterback position? I mean, if Andrew Luck comes out of retirement, <laughs> comes back and plays, I would be the happiest man alive. Well, all the Colts <laughs> fans would be. Uh, don't expect that. You know, uh, don't that that's a that's that's something that most likely will not happen, and I'm not holding my breath. Uh, <sighs> There are, honestly, there, there's no real upgrades to Carson Wentz, which is what, what makes this trade go, what the heck? You know, especially after Aaron Rodgers is like, I'm staying. Uh, Russell Wilson's already moved to Denver. And you're like, my choice, my two best choices are Derek Carr and Jimmy Garoppolo. Those kind of seem like lateral movements to me, you know. Um, so... My expectation, this draft is not, look, we, we've already talked about it, right? This this draft does not have any quarterbacks that you go, oh my, this is going to be my next 15-year franchise quarterback, right? None of them do, uh, especially starting right away and then doing that, right? Um, so my expectation coming into this is, a stopgap quarterback that works well with the system that's not going to turn the football over too much. And either A, this year, draft somebody that you feel could end up, you know, growing into that position or saving up or piling up assets to use as ammo next year because the NFL changes on a yearly basis right next year there could be multiple free agents that are a quarterback or or a team that's willing to trade because quarterbacks and teams have fallouts all the time you know and wait until next year and hope that you have enough ammo in order to go get somebody next year whether in the draft or in free agency or a trade i have the solution to the colts problem you got me. I saw something this morning. I forgot about it. You reminded me of it. So Jimmy Garoppolo is probably going to be your quarterback. What you really don't want to do if you're the Colts, you've had five quarterbacks in five years now. And do you really want to do six and six? Do you really want to keep this going? Do you want to bring in a guy who's your quarterback for one year and then have to figure out what's next after him? And if you bring in Jimmy Garoppolo, you're going to be fine. You're not going to win a Super Bowl. Then you're not gonna have a high first round pick. You're like it just there it's if you keep going with middle of the road options, you're gonna stay a middle of the road football team that can't have any kind of movement upwards. Mm -hmm. The only name and Deshaun Watson's out, it's not gonna happen. He's in your division, you're not gonna trade him division rival. The only thought that actually really, really excites me, and this is a name that I have been connected to for a long time. I went to college with him. I absolutely love this guy. Gardner Minshew. And I know he's a meme. I know people love him. But look at what he's done. He's actually – I we've never seen Gardner Minshew on a really good football team with a great running game, a great receiver, a great defense. You want a good leader. You want a guy who the locker room can rally behind. That guy's Gardner Minshew. He's going to be cheaper than any other option out there. I would argue he's better than Jimmy Garoppolo. He's never been given a shot. He's younger, and he's the only option I can see out there that would be someone who – he might be the, just a one-year guy, the same way Jimmy Garoppolo would be. But he could be longer than that, and he could play at a high level. And I think that's when you throw out there that, like, hey, let's, let's see what happens here. 
And I, I, I really love that thought. He's cheaper. He's younger. You don't have to give him a ton of money. And because he's on a, a really cheap contract, you can actually bring in really great players around him and build around him the way you probably wouldn't have been able to financially around Carson Wentz. So, man, I, I think that that's the option right there. That's the only one. When I look around at every option, other than maybe Andrew Luck coming out of retirement, that I go, hey, Gardner Minshew is your best answer. That I, I would love to see what they could do around him. I've talked about that. There's two quarterbacks, I think, that the Colts could possibly grab that haven't had a an honest, fair shot with a good team. Um, obviously, Gardner Minshew, he's got upside. You're right. He could end up crashing and burning, be a below-average quarterback. Or, That'd be good for you, though, too, because then you'd get a high first-round pick. Be, well, it's kind of a enough. win-win. Yeah. Um, but he, he does have a higher ceiling. Right, he, yeah. he could end up being a really good. There's another quarterback that I view very similar, and I've gotten a lot of pushback from this. Name me a quarterback in the last ten years that's played worth a darn for Chicago. Nobody, nobody, oh, right? Don't say it, man. Because they've had no offensive line. They've ah. had Matt Nagy calling <laughs> plays. They, they, I mean, it is true. The only, the only positive that he has had is Allen Robinson. Right? Am I wrong? No. And he plays very similar. Here, here's that, yeah, no, so uh, what I hate about this is you're making sense. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, dang it, dang it. Here's the thing, though. I, I think to get to risky, you're going to have to pay a lot more money. And do you want to pay? Would you rather have Mitchell Trubisky on a, an expensive contract or Gardner Minshew on $5 million a year? I mean, man, I would rather take my – chance with Gardner Minshew with nothing and then you can make a lot of heavy free agent moves you can bring in a good team around him I think you can build more around Gardner Minshew than you can around Trubisky simply because he's going to be a cheaper option and I don't know I I uh, Trubisky is not horrible we'll see him get a shot I I have notoriously been very harsh on Trubisky for years uh and we've learned in recent times that look I thought you watched the film a lot of moments where Trubisky had guys wide open, and you're like, Trubisky, dude, what are you doing? You got to pull the trigger on that deep ball. That's wide open. You got you to make it happen. And he didn't. But then we saw how bad the Bears are, were as a roster, how bad mm-hmm. they were coached. And if you know Justin Fields didn't look any better, Andy Dalton didn't look any better. Like, So was it a yeah. coaching problem? So I, I am open to hearing Trubisky and seeing what he can do on a good football team with different coaching. I just, I just like – Makes you better. I'm I'm very biased. I love the guy. He's been I, I one agree. of my favorite players for years. One hundred percent agree with you. I, I think I think that uh Gardner Minshew is the better option. I'm just saying don't be surprised if if uh Trubisky ends up on a decent team. Oh yeah, and he surprises will. a lot of people. Trubisky's you know? gonna make a lot of money. Mike Glennon at one point got paid upwards of fifty million dollars to be a starting quarterback in the NFL by the Chicago Bears, actually. <laughs> so I I mean, if, if a guy like Mike Glennon can make upwards of $50 million, Trubisky's going to get something. And somebody's going to get desperate. They're not going to have the quarterback they want, and they're going to make an offer. I would just be really disappointed if it was the Colts that were the team that took a shot at Trubisky. I want to see Trubisky go to the Giants, actually. Go play for Brian Dable. Go compete with Daniel Jones. May the best man win. Uh Man, but the Colts have no other options. It's so frustrating and disappointing because... What if the Giants trade for Deshaun Watson? Then what you do Daniel you think Jones? of Daniel... See, the, here, here's where... This Same is bad, situation. <laughs> dude, no, this is how bad it is, man. The, all this uh-huh. really is showing is how bad the Colts quarterback options are because you're now exactly. talking about potential excitement for Daniel Jones? Right. That's when you know the world is bad for Colts fans. (laughs) The the, the options are just so poor this year. That's why I'm like, don't don't go into this season thinking we're going to get our franchise guy, right? You're going to want to build up and get weapons for next year. It sucks. It means, again, like you said, we're going to end up another year of, you know, playing the quarterback carousel. But there just really isn't any options outside of miracles, you know, that that the Colts have that they're going to end up getting a franchise guy um, that's going to be there for years and years to come. Which yeah, is man, why, I, which one's what makes this Wentz trade just 
a head scratcher. I, I see, unfortunately, the next couple of years being a problem for the Colts where they're not going to have a high first round pick. There's not a lot of options available. There's not a lot of trade options. I, I think it could be three years before we see the Colts get back to having – they're going to be a good football team without a quarterback for a while, unfortunately. Um, and I, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, it, it all traces back to Andrew Luck retiring early and throwing all their plans out of whack. But, <laughs> I, mean, ugh, I mean, we're talking about Phillip Rivers maybe coming back from coaching high school football to be the Colts quarterback again. Like, things are not good for the Colts at all. I want to ask you – what should the Colts do in the NFL draft? Like, what do you have any? I know we're a little bit early, about a month away still, but what do you want to happen for the Colts during the draft? And what moves should they make? And what moves, what moves, like, what holes do they need to fill on their roster? Well, there's three holes that need to be filled in the draft, and quarterback is not one of them. I don't want the Colts to grab a quarterback. Uh, and like I said, there's not a quarterback in this draft that I feel is a long-term quarterback. So why spend uh, a mid-high round pick on something that you're that's just going to ride the the bench the entire time? I, I just I, I don't like that idea at all. Um, we need a left tackle because Eric Fisher's gone. Uh, reports are he will probably won't be re-signed. So that's an option and. Lucky for the Colts that the tackle position in this draft is pretty pretty deep. Uh, the Colts could use, I hate saying this because they spent a lot of draft picks on this position, high draft picks, a edge rusher. They need another edge rusher. Uh, no one has proven themselves on the edge yet. All these second and first round picks that the Colts have spent – and no one on this team has gotten more than six sacks. Uh, of all those guys, they spent, you know, first round, second, 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 second in, in Chris Ballard's career. And the other thing is we need someone opposite Michael Pittman Jr. Uh, and again, you know, the draft is deep at wide receiver, uh, especially when it comes to speed receivers, right? Um, T.Y. Hilton may or may not come back, but let's face it, he's at the end of his career and he's not been Mr. Reliable the last few years. And outside of that, Paris Campbell hasn't been reliable. So, you know, there there really isn't a second option for the Indianapolis Colts. Um, there is a possibility of, of going and grabbing in the mid-rounds a tight end um, with Jack Doyle retiring now. Uh, the only tight end that's left on the roster is last year's draft pick Kylan Granson because Mo Ali Cox currently is also a free agent. I, I feel like the Colts will give Mo Ali Cox a, a an offer, and I'm hoping that he comes back to Indy. But currently, right now, like I said, we have one tight end, so I I like where we're at at linebacker. I like where the Colts are at at corner and safety at starting positions. The starters, I like where the start. Some depth in the secondary would be nice, you know. Uh, obviously, probably not the main priority though. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I like the starters. So, you know, later on in the draft, fifth, sixth, seventh round pick for a, a defensive back would be good for depth. And that's do, that's where I want to go with the draft. Do the Colts have enough cap room to make a move for a receiver like Juju Smith or Schuster or something like that? I think I think the Colts have enough uh, cap room to. They've got a lot of free agents on their roster, so they got a lot of spaces to fill. But with, I mean, they're sitting at like seventy one million right now, which is tops in the NFL. Uh, granted, they need a quarterback, right? They need a left tackle. Man, I um, I, I gotta say real quick, uh, this just really brings it home to me that you trade for Gardner Minshew, and then you make a bunch of aggressive moves in free agency. That's the only way the Colts are going to quickly get back to being a potential playoff team. Because if you don't figure out the quarterback, or you overpay for an expensive quarterback, and then you can't fill those other positions, look, would you rather have Jimmy Garoppolo and then not have a quarter, not have a left tackle and not have a receiver, or pay Gardner nothing and then bring in better players around him? 
And then at least even if Gardner isn't your quarterback, you're, you're a, a, a viable option for when you can find a, a long-term quarterback and you're an attractive option for whatever quarterback is out there. If you can keep costs low on the quarterback position and really pay Juju Smith-Schuster, find a left tackle, find an edge rusher maybe in free agency. I mean, Jadavian Clowney's out there. I'm just throwing names out now, but like something where you're not relying on rookies next year at key positions and then you can maybe see if a guy like Minshew would work. I mean, that that sounds like the plan to me. It's the only one I can think of that makes any sense for the Colts next year. If you're, yeah, if you're not going to be able to spend your money on a quarterback, then go out and fill the spots around the quarterback that you need to fill. I completely and utterly agree. Go get your quarterback next year, or at least you know if the quarterback you grab this year does not work out, then you can go yeah. see if you can't grab him next year. My guys that I think would fit great at free agency in spots of need, uh, my favorite edge rusher right now, I think that if you put Chandler Jones beside DeForest Buckner, that is a nasty duo. Who are you going to double team, right? Um, and he's got the build to play the Leo pass rusher position. You know, well, and it that, could bring the best out of uh, your young rookie, well, what's his uh, name? Uh, Quiddy Pay. Quiddy Pay, yeah, there you go. So that could actually, because if, if you give Quiddy Pay a, a, build a dynamic duo at your edge rusher position where you've got two guys off the edge, the better guy you get, the better Quiddy Pay will play, and then mm-hmm. that'll help DeForest Buckner inside as well. Because they all three, you know, all those positions work really w- together. You have to have interior pressure to get stress on the outside with your edge rusher, and so I, I, I hadn't thought about that. Chandler Jones would be amazing on the Colts. Um, now my my favorite guy that was available uh, via trade or free agent signing was Amari Cooper, but that's right out the window. Uh, <laughs> darn it! Somebody beat the Colts to him. I love Allen Robinson. I do. Mm. Uh, I think Allen. Ro- I think you pair Allen Robinson up on one side, and Michael Pittman Jr. on the other. Is he going to go there though without a quarterback? That's the thing, right? Or play with Trubisky again? Right. <laughs> no. 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 I love him, but I don't see him coming. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think he'd fit well. Yeah. I think he'd love the locker room and, and the guys that are already here, but I don't think he'd come. Um. Juju is a guy I don't know. Uh, does he fit the locker room scheme? He's that TikTok guy and, and and known for that. And Chris Ballard, you know how he is about that kind of stuff. With you know, uh, so that that kind of makes me wonder: Would Ballard even be interested in Juju Smith Schuster? I don't know. You know, uh, but the the good thing is there there are a ton of like I said uh, this year. Wide receivers are a dime a dozen. You're going to have to draft one because if if you think that Juju Smith-Schuster, Allen Robinson, you can get your left tackle solid in free agency, you can get your edge rusher solid in free agency, you're not going to convince a receiver that wants to win or respects himself to come to Indy where you don't have a quarterback mm-hmm. at all. And then you're putting your, your future on the line because receivers need a good quarterback to put up good numbers to make more money and to enjoy their life. And you just can't – you're not going to be able to recruit or convince Juju to come there when he has other options but better quarterbacks available. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, well, it, it works both ways, don't it? I mean, how are, how are you going to convince a quarterback to want to come to the Indianapolis Colts when the only option they have to throw to is Michael Pittman Jr., mm-hmm. right? Because everybody yeah, I, I else think is you hurt or retired. Because you, you, the quarterback options you're going to have are, are guys you're going to trade for where they have to come. A free agent receiver has way more agency than a quarterback you traded for. Well, like Jimmy Garoppolo some, can't say no. Well, no. What does Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't have a no trade clause? Why? Well, if he does, I'm sure he'd come to the Colts because he's happy to. Um, you know what I mean? Like you're just. It's so much more rare to get an opportunity to play quarterback in the NFL than it is to be a part of a receiving core. Well, and yeah. If, if you're Juju, you're like Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes sounds pretty dang fun to me. Well, it's just like I was, I was asking that because like the Russell Wilson trade that happened, you know, I yeah. mean Ballard might have offered four first round picks for him, you know, and and Quentin Nelson and Darius Leonard on top of it. But if Russell Wilson didn't want to play for the Colts, he just said no, hmm. you know, because he had that no trade clause. Yeah. The, the same with Deshaun Watson. Obviously, Deshaun Watson's a different case. You don't trade in. Yeah, you don't trade in division. 
uh, especially a, in my opinion, a top three quarterback talent in the NFL um, to your divisional rival. You know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to play that guy twice a year. No, I, you know, <laughs> I'm, especially I'm really when he doesn't like your team and, and, and hates you. <laughs> <laughs> the punishment and revenge Deshaun Watson would feel. I, I want to know. I look at some of the talent on the Colts roster, and if this quarterback situation isn't figured out, you're in danger of you know wasting the career of Quinton Nelson, of Darius Leonard, of Kenny Moore, like good players who I think are. It's a shame to see these good players not have a guy to run the the ship the way they need to, and to see players I like and respect not winning makes me feel really bad. Is there a danger of risking and wasting their careers? Uh, yes. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of names you didn't, add, you know, the, the, the Jonathan Taylors, then the Naheem Hines. Uh, yeah, it's a good team. You know, it is. It Michael is Pittman a very, Jr. Yeah, there, there's a lot of really good players on this team. And if you don't have the right guy at the helm, you're not going anywhere. Uh, when was the last time a, uh, a below average quarterback won a Super Bowl? It, it, it don't happen very often, right? It does not happen. You want to you want to see uh, what why you need a good quarterback. Go back to the AFC Championship. Go watch or not well, whatever the the Kansas City Buffalo game. Oh my goodness, the last six minutes of it, right? Just go watch the last <laughs> six minutes of that, and that'll tell you why you need a really good quarterback in the NFL. So yeah, this is there are they are in danger of that and. That's why I say make plans now for next year. Don't screw, like you said, don't be a mediocre year after year after year. Make plans to make a move. If you can't make the move this year, make the plans, plan ahead to make that move next year. Yeah. Um, man, that's all I have on the Colts. Is there anything else that really like fires you up and you're passionate about you want to talk about? Oh, my. Uh I've talked so much about the Colts today. Uh, I, 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 I love my Indianapolis Colts, um, but at the same time, there's just... Uh, the Carson Wentz thing has really taken a major foothold. The, the, the lack of a quarterback has taken such a major mm-hmm. foothold that it's, it's hard to think about some of the other things that uh, really the Indianapolis Colts need to do. I, I love the organization. I, I think... I don't know if uh, this was mentioned. This is why it's hard to dislike Jim Ursay for putting his foot foot down and saying we got to have a new quarterback. The things he does for communities is amazing. When the Super Bowl happened, not only did he give tickets away to Colts fans to go see the game, he gave a tickets away two tickets to a Bengals fan. So that they could go to the Super Bowl, right? And and, and, and plane tickets, hotel room, and, and you know, and, and the game tickets just to go see the. I don't know another owner that would give tickets to a different team's fan to go to a Super Bowl, you know. And that's why I can't be too mad at Ursay because he he's competitive and he wants to win, and so the only problem is don't put your team in a hole because of it. <laughs> you know, Jim Irsay is like a good follow on Twitter. Jim Irsay is like really mm-hmm. interesting and is always doing like little giveaways and a thousand bucks if you can answer this trivia question or I'll send you a hat or like he really is very good at, I mean, he's a, he seems like a, a billionaire who loves football, is kind of bored on Twitter, just wanting to interact with people and share his love of the game. I mean, that really is how it comes across. Yeah, he does. He, he gives... Um, Every week, sometimes twice a week, he does those giveaways, and a lot of times it'll be, he'll he'll be in a mood and be like, "All right, I'm gonna name your favorite." Uh, uh, many times last year, he's like, "I'm, I'm gonna give away two thousand uh, dollars to you and two thousand dollars to a charity of your choice," you know, or mm-hmm. something like that, you know, uh, or. Uh, try to help the community out and be like, I'm going to give you a thousand dollar gift certificate to a local uh, restaurant or something that of your choice, things of that nature. He's, he's always uh, in and up about that. Something I do want to bring up 
I just thought about it, all right? The Combine. This could legitimately be the last year that the Combine is in Indianapolis. That is a sad thing because if you ask any GM or coach or player what they think of the Combine being in Indy, and it's because I've heard this reported by so many people and not just local media, I'm talking national media, talking about how it's it's great, it's perfect, you know. Everything is set up, the the uh, being able to get to and fro, and there's never any snags uh, in it and stuff like that. And now they're talking about it, it could end up being in L.A., or it could be end up oh. in Dallas, or, you know. And I had a, one of our guys... That, uh, I was actually talking to him, uh, had him on my show, uh, I think it was last week, we were sitting there talking about it, uh, who is actually part of the, the, the Colts official podcast. He said, I hope that it is in Dallas next year and they tank it as bad as they did the Super Bowl. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And that'll that'll put that into this is why it should stay in Indy, you know. I mean, it's it's the center of the U.S. It's easier for all the college guys to get in, you know. Uh, not too much travel one direction or another. It's just it, it's a, it's a great great place for the combine to be. So, uh, I just it, it's it's sad. I I I I, I hope that the Colts. Uh, the the Lucas Oil Stadium will be able to host the combine again shortly. I know they're they're putting in bids for it for the next two years, but I don't see it happening. I wish they would just sign a twenty five year deal to keep it at Indy. I really like it, it's man. I got a lot of stuff to say about this, if, if I may. Um, I think in one sense, not only is it it means way more to Indy than it ever will to L A. or uh, Dallas. I. It's a football mecca there, sure, I, I guess, but Dallas doesn't need it. And what's really frustrating about this narrative and this uh, this story and this potential here is that you're going to take it away from a, a community that loves it, that appreciates it, that relies on it, that uses it very heavily, and give it to L.A., who doesn't need it, who I don't, I'm not very impressed with L.A. I don't like their politics. I don't like the way their cities run, all that stuff. And what's really... Man, I, I don't know if my my borderline conservative values that come out here, but it's really frustrating that like the middle of the country is so often forgotten about, not appreciated, not talked about. You're gonna send it out to L.A. What are we doing? Like, I, they don't need it. They don't care about it. And it, it's really frustrating that like they, I don't know. I'm not from the Midwest, but I have a great love for the Midwest, the middle of the country. And I mean, I'll, I'll be in Indy in September. I can't wait to meet you in person and we can hang out and drink a beer together, right? And I I just really think it'd be such a shame to send it to a place like LA. I'm like, really? Like, we don't, it, it's not needed there. It's also a long ass flight from the East Coast. I think it's a, a central location in Indy, but it's more than that. It's a place that appreciates it and that actually mm-hmm. wants it and uses it. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. What's wrong with it in Indy? What's the benefit of sending it to L.A.? It's not going to be cheaper for anybody. It's not going to be better for anybody. I don't know who wins. Maybe the media. There's maybe more media out there, question mark. I don't know. I think it's really fun that everyone converges on Indy for the combat. I'm going to go next year. I really am excited for that. And I I just am so disappointed to hear the potential that they're going to take it away from a city who loves it, respects it, and uses it so well. Yeah, I think it's became more of a a money maker. Uh, I think they're going to do it like they do the draft, you know, just send it to different town after, because that has worked out somewhat, you know, with the draft and, and they make money off of it. It's a, sure. it's a spectacle, but, and there's just more people in Dallas or LA or something of that nature. But well, let me say something though, real quick. So I, I follow video games really closely. I love, I love games and there's an event called E3, which you know what that is. Mm-hmm. E3 is this, yeah, it's this big expo for games. And what it used to be was a place for people to show off their games and connect with media that media could then tell their fan base about 
the games. It was like a, a way to really get everyone together and get access and share the next upcoming stuff. E3 opened things up to fans and ruined the event. It lost all its meaning. It really, it really destroyed and hurt that event. You don't need fans at the Combine. Who is the Combine for? It's not a spectacle. It's not for fans. It's for mm-hmm. teams to gather information and players to connect with your teams. And I, you don't need to add fans to that equation. You just don't. And, oh, man, that fires me up. Like, that, you can't make you, – it has to be a football event. It can't be a marketing or fan event. Just not what it is and not what it should be. Yeah, I mean, but that's, I mean, the NFL is a business. Yeah. That's the problem, you know. (laughs) I mean, uh, they're a business and they're about making money. And that's what all any business is about is making money. So whatever they can do to to increase that profit margin, they're going to do, uh, no matter whether or not it's, it's better for the teams or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, uh, that's all I have. I love you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. I, I, I'm looking at my schedule. I am probably going to be in Indy for week one of the NFL season, and I would love to. I'm going to get an Airbnb. I want to have you over. I want to record a podcast with you. I think I'll be there literally. If, if we can, it looks like Thursday or Friday after the so season starts like on a Thursday night football game. If you want to come over like Friday to my Airbnb, we can record a podcast. I think that'd be really fun. I really want that. That would be incredible. Um, and regardless, I can't wait to meet you in person and shake your hand and Absolutely. drink a beer. And I, Absolutely. I just, dude, I love you so much, man. I really appreciate your time on the show. And uh, do you have anything else you want to talk about before we, we call it a day? Man, I just want to say thanks for having me on. I, I love interacting with you. We, we have very similar views, it seems mm-hmm. like to me, you know. And it's nice to be able to talk with someone who has similar views because if we just constantly button heads, then it seems like no, nothing goes <laughs> goes well. Very, yeah. I mean, it's, I'm not it's Steve nice. A. Smith. It's nice for content. <laughs> it's nice for you, content. You idiots! I can yell at you if you want me to. I don't want you though. <laughs> but no, nah, man. Uh, I, I, I could imagine that we'd be really good friends if we lived in the same town but lawrence i am <laughs> flabbergasted that you would say that i cannot right be- i cannot believe you would bring that up on the show <laughs> oh my Sorry. goodness it's like Stephen a and max right i mean <laughs> <laughs> we should do that someday just i i don't know what we could argue that's the thing is i don't have anything to argue with you about i love you and i i'm too, i yeah. respect you too much to yell at you i can't believe I, those shows are a joke man it's, like, it's theater it's not it's not anal- it analysis is. Yeah, oh. exactly. But, exactly. Uh, but, anyway, Lawrence, yeah. thank you, my man. You're the best. Hope you have a great day. Thank you to everyone listening. And uh, but um bum bam, we are done.